morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bernard Marty, and I am uh, um, Vice President of the Euro European Association of Geochemistry, and I welcome you for this uh, medal award session and plenary session. So, today we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Andrew Revkin, and uh, who will speak about uh, the Anthropocene, the age of us. And before that, we'll, we'll have uh, an award ceremony. Uh, the Shensu Award will be, uh, um, will be discerned, the European Mineralogy Union will be discerned, and the A EAGC Award will be also. So, uh, let's start the ceremony, and I would like to, to call now um, Dr. Sun for the Shensu Award. Please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to be here uh, to present the 10th Senshu Sang Award. Uh, Senshu Sang Award is designed to recognize uh, young scientists who work in mainland China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong uh, under the age of 40. Now, this year's Senshu Sang Award goes to Dr. Li Pingqing. In recognition of her uh, contributions in stable isotopes like chromium, uh, titanium, and uh, many other uh, isotopes. To the team team. Well deserved. And now I would like to call um, uh, for the European Mineralogy uh, Union, if you could come to the stage, please. So, thank you very much. I'm William Heinrich, President of the European Mineralogical Union, and it is with great pleasure presenting to you Encarnacion Ruiz Agudo this year's medalist of the Research Excellent Medalist of the European Mineralogical Union. And the annually awarded silver medal is for young scientists who made significant contributions to research and who are also active in strengthening European scientific links. And from the citation, uh, which reads part of it, the EMU Research Excellent Medal is awarded to Encarnacion Ruiz Agudo, Department of Mineralogy and Petrology, University of Granada, Spain, Granada, Spain, and he is awarded the EMU Medal for Excellence in Research in recognition for important contribution, contributions to the field of mineral water interactions and related phenomena. Her research finds a wide range of applications from weathering processes and geochemical process toxins to crystal growth processes and environmental remediation. And she gave her medalist talk already on Monday where Andrew Putnis did uh, a uh, dissertation for her. And I would like to thank the EMU for such a uh, big distin distinction. I'm quite honored uh, to, to be here as a, our deed for this EMU Research Excellent Medal. And also I would like to thank uh, all the people who I collaborate with, the people in the Department of the University of Granada, 
and also the people in, in the Institute for Mineral Gear of the University of Munster and the, gr and the group of uh, Christine and Andrew Putnam. Thank you very much. Congratulations again. Uh, and now it's time for the EAGC award. Good morning. My name is Tom Bowen. I'm the former secretary of the International Association of Geochemistry, uh, but I'm representing the organization with the pleasure of presenting the Abelman Award, which is our biannual award for a geochemist of particular merit below the age of 35 years old. It's named for Jean Jacques Joseph Abelman, who is a young scientist who, by the age of 38, had published on such important topics as magnesium and silicon uh, behavior in the environment in relation to weathering. Our medalist this year is Sophie Overgelt from the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, who already at her young age has made significant contributions in the field of silicon and magnesium isotope geochemistry, two of the most challenging isotope systems that we deal with, and there is only an upward trajectory from here. So I'm very pleased to give this award to Sophie Overgelt and to have this wonderful smile in a picture with her. Okay, so it's time for, for today's plenary lecture. Um, uh, society and the science are vigorously debating how to respond to the Anthropocene, the age of us, as uh, Vladimir Vernadsky, the famous Russian geochemist, defined it. The questions are, do we have to degrow, as some propose, or can the pulse of scientific and technological progress now facilitate a transition to low-impact properties? And this question will be addressed by the prize-winning journalist and author Andrew Reikin, who has been exploring such questions for several decades. Andy is a senior fellow for environmental understanding at Pace University. He has been writing about environmental and, soci and social sustainability for more than three decades, from the Amazon to the White House, the Hudson Valley to the North Pole, and he worked mainly for the New York Times. He has won the top award in science journalism multiple times, along with a Guggenheim Fellow. At Pace, he teaches courses in blogging, environmental communication, and documentary film. He has written a claimed book on global warming, the changing Arctic, and the violent assault the Amazon rainforest. A Time magazine named one of the, uh, naming his, uh, his, his blog, Dot Earth, one of the top 25 blogs in 2013. And last but not least, Andy is a performing songwriter. He was a long-time accompanist for Pete Seeger's, and he recently released a first album on the, of original songs, which was hailed as a tasty mix of fruits goulash, which is quite appropriate for Prague, on jam bands, an influential music website, and also from his writing and books, two major movies has been done, Rockstar and The Burning Season, which uh, the last one which starred Raoul Julia and won two Emmy Awards and three Golden Globes. So please welcome An Andrew Hefkin for his plenary talk. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, and it was also a pleasure to see all those awards go to women. Uh, th there was a recent discussion on Twitter about um, the perils of the, the manthropocene, not the anthropocene. And you're demonstrating right here that that's maybe a uh, piece of fiction there. We, to have so much great science being done by women uh, is a real sign of 
great progress. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Anthropocene. I'm going I'm to race through sections of this talk because the time is short. Um, you can reach me easily by Twitter, at Revkin, or Revkin at Gmail, as you saw earlier. Um, these curves, you all know. I mean, we are in, we're in Zoom mode, right? You know, so many different fields, so many different data sets show that um, humanity in the last couple hundred years has been uh, on this unbelievable trajectory. And we're not the first species to have a, sort of a global pulse of power and change. You know, actually not the first life form. Back in um, ages ago, as you all know, uh, cyanobacteria changed the atmosphere in a profound way and it kind of like completely, uh, uh, disruptively changed uh, Earth systems, the great oxygen catastrophe, as some call it. But cyanobacteria weren't looking up going, hey, look what we just did. And that's what distinguishes us from other species that have sort of become powerful influences on the planet. We are at least now starting to look up and go, hey, what's going on here? We are doing something here. Science for the last half century essentially has been saying to society, uh, there's an edge to the petri dish. You know, there's like, there are boundaries, whatever you want to call it, planetary boundaries, uh, uh, footprint, um, how many Earths we've already consumed, that kind of thing. Science is basically saying to society, it's time to change our ways. And, and that message has looked like this. 2007, you know, I've been covering the IPCC process since before there was an IPCC, since the 1980s. And, and this was kind of the classic, the IPCC presentation of information has been kind of like Moses coming down from the mountain with, with the tablets and saying, here's what we're doing to rivers, here's what we're doing to food, and with this sort of finger pointing quality. And when you look at society's reactions, uh, it seems more that we're resistant to that knowledge. Now, since the scientists and journalists, we've kind of had lots of achievements in, in kind of engaging with the idea that we're now a planetary force, whether it's through climate change or, or the other science that's emerged, pointing to this uh, geological age of us. And so we got lots of awards. Um, I've gotten some awards. You know, we all get the ribbons. And, and But society so far has been like the scene from Rebel Without a Cause, which was a very popular American movie a long time ago. Well, you know what kind of drunken brawls those kind of parties turn into? It's not a place for kids. A minute ago, you said you didn't care if he drinks. He said a little drink. You're tearing me apart! So you probably get the sense that we are the parent, you know, whether it's the serious science journalist writing cover stories for magazines or, or the series of IPCC reports. We're basically saying the same thing that Jim Backus was saying to James Dean there. You know, if you don't X, Y will happen. But there's a lot of resistance to that. So my question going forward, and, and for many years, has been, so what do we do? You know, can we change that dynamic? Is there a way around those, those barriers to understanding? And you'll see that some of the ways forward, I think, are surprising. Um, because, of course, as you know, the trends have not exactly abated. This was uh, an annual tradition in the United States called Black Friday, where after we all eat too much on Thanksgiving, we then buy too much the day after. And um, it doesn't look very pretty. And in my mind, if you think, well, can, can 9 billion people, can you envision 9 billion people doing that? And that, again, gets to the sense of this, is, this, can't, be, this can't work. And this is what it looks like on the ground. You know, ivory demand in, in Asia is propelling uh, really big problems for megafauna in Africa. And you think, oh, oh, those Asian societies, how dare they? But then we have to remember that this process, this Anthropocene has been building for a while. And I like to sort of remind myself that way, but looking back uh, at the American um, rush, the land rush in the 1800s, which um, this was a pile of... Um, uh, bison skulls. There were so many bison skulls littering the Great Plains. Someone said, hey, that's a resource. If you uh, char that like charcoal, you get a pigment called black carbon. Uh, uh, not uh, carbon black, the opposite of black carbon. And that used to be, uh, that's a, sort of a pigment you put in, in ink and that kind of thing. So it just says to me that I try to remind myself that when I, when I do the shame on you-ish thinking about uh, parts of the, of the world that are now, just now getting into this sort of consumption consumptive habit, I kind of remind myself, well, we, you know, we've been there before, too. But still, we're sort of like, still like this, you, you step back, if you were like an um, alien intelligence looking at Earth, you kind of think, you see this big growth thing going on, and there's not much to distinguish that pattern from bacteria smeared on agar, on a plate of agar. You know, like I said, the, that petri dish, so far, we're not getting that message. 
And that's what's led a lot of people, I'm sure more than a few in this room, and people like me, have felt like this cameraman I took this picture of in Copenhagen at the end of the climate talks in 2009 is kind of, you feel pretty dissipated when you consider these trajectories and the fact that information so far, there's not a lot of sense that that has mattered. There are these counterexamples like the ozone treaty, but the, even that is a complicated story and we can, we can talk about that forever. So circling back to the initial thought, this is really what I want, want to focus on. Why, you know, what can we do now? So we've identified the Anthropocene, the sense of edge, the sense of limits. So how do you go forward? Uh, and is there a good path? You know, can you have a good path in a time with so many trajectories that are so troubling and you've seen so much loss of biodiversity and not just individual species, but ecosystems, migratory patterns, uh, the disruptions from uh, invasive species, and you, you can't, you know, so is there even a good path? Uh, my friend Betsy Colbert, who wrote the book The Sixth Extinction, when I was in a debate with someone online about this notion of a good Anthropocene, and, and she tweeted this, where she said, uh, two words that probably should not be used in sequence are good and Anthropocene. Um, I disagree, and if you could go on Twitter and sort of sift back for how that discussion was played out. And, and my main thinking on why we're poised to have much better outcomes is because we have an unbelievable uh, number of tools that have evolved to uh, globally share and shape ideas at a pace and in a scope that's never been possible. And it's all been just the last few years. It's just, and, and that's why the turbulence in the internet, the web, uh, the, the divisiveness, the sort of the feeling of overload and all that, I think are, I wouldn't say temporary, but they're, they're, you can kind of work through them and find ways to, to use these media that are incredibly constructive. And that could poise us for a great period of progress with a huge number of losses. You know, and I've, I've written about a bunch of them already. In three decades of, of this. So, and, and, and in sifting through um, what, we're, what we're poised for, I go back to Darwin in his less known book, The Descent of Man, 1871. He wrote this, this really interesting passage. Uh, as, as we advance in civilization, small tribes are united into larger communities. The simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to everyone, basically. The point, that point being reached, there's only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. And then further in that book, he also talked about other species, that we, the empathy builds through connectedness. And think of those words, artificial barrier. We are now transcending that artificial barrier. There used to be a barrier, it was called oceans. You know, you, information took weeks, and then uh, you know, through, tele, through telegraphy, it, it wasn't weeks anymore, but it was, talk about low bandwidth. Now, now you can send and shape ideas in ways, in, even among the scientific community, not just between science and the public, in ways that we've, we're still getting used to. Think about open review journals, uh, written recently about Jim Hansen's new paper. There are many problems with the, the way that plays out, but there's huge opportunities. I think it's, and it's kind of the future in many ways. It's actually the present in many ways. So this goes back, here's where Vernadsky comes in. He was a really interesting, you know, he was a geochemist who, who had this ability to step back and look at these broader phenomena. He wasn't just studying geochemistry on a local basis. And he's, he really, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, had to find this idea that, that we've, we're becoming a global geochemical force when you add up what we're doing to nutrient flows and, and all that kind of thing. And at the same time, there's this French theologian, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and they intersected. They actually met in Paris and they heard each other's lectures. And they kind of closed in on this idea of newosphere which is separate than the Anthropocene, but very related. This is the idea that we are now, uh, that, that we're creating a sort of planetary intelligence. It was a, at that point a very philosophical, abstract idea, and now it's becoming more concrete. So I kind of, recently I've been using a different spelling. Newosphere is a Greek-rooted word, uh, planet of the mind. Uh, and they saw this as a, a prospect, sort of a window, a vision of how intelligence can make Earth uh, a more uh, prosperous and thriving entity. I kind of use noosphere just because it's easier. And uh, what I think of, when I think of noosphere, it, it, it's, it's not just the fact that we're building systems that connect each other. Those, those, remember, ISIS has used YouTube very effectively to recruit uh, you know, terrorists who are fond of beheading people. So, so these systems can work in negative ways as well as positive ways. They can isolate us as much as they can connect us. Through Facebook, you're surrounded by your friends. It's not people you don't know. 
And so your friends are feeding you information that's sort of like the kind of information you might get uh, from, from, from your, your neighbor. It's just not the full picture of the world. But, but the noosphere is like the work it takes to build conscious, constructive, forward-looking relationships aimed at making the world a better place. And it's, it's universities, museums, companies, uh, governmental institutions can, are part of this. Uh, and the more connected you are, the more you take that think about, well, something interesting is happening over here with how we convey this information about uh, uh, carbon isotopes in Arctic uh, ice sheets. And that, but it's re relevant over here. Let's get it, move that information, have that thought that maybe it's relevant somewhere else. And then things start to happen that can surprise us. Um, so I, I'm going to just chart very, as quickly as I can, my own learning curve on these things, which comes through, remember, I'm not a scientist. Uh, my only doctorate is an honorary doctorate. Um, but I've been now writing about issues like this since 1983, and in a way that's kind of unusual, where looking at global change globally, and I've been from the North Pole to the Amazon to the White House to a bunch of IPCC meetings and, and framework convention meetings. So I've had this kind of overview. And this is what uh, Murray Gellman, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, now at the Santa Fe Institute, talks about um, the merits of taking a crude look at the whole. That's, uh, he actually had an acronym, CLAW. So if you search for Murray Gellman, G-E-L-L-M-A-N-N, -N, and CLAW, you'll find his lecture on the idea that it's, there's merit in looking at the whole picture in a crude way, even as we also dig in in very specific ways on important uh, prismatic parts of the big questions as well. We need both. Now, I grew up in the, mostly in the 20th century. I think increasingly when I talk to young audiences, most of the people in the room have spent most of their life in the 21st. Uh, but back then, you know, if you were writing about the environment, or thinking about the environment, it was mostly from two frames of reference. One was woe is me, and another was shame on you. It's somebody's fault. It's a company or a politician. Um, and I started to think increasingly that it's, uh, well, you'll, you'll see it's more complicated than that. But back then, my first big environmental story was on uh, an herbicide that was also very toxic if you consumed it, if you drank it or sprayed it in your, in your mouth and that kind of thing. And, and back then it was kind of easy. These environmental problems were sort of easy in the 20th century in the sense that, uh, like here, um, the company that um, manufactured PowerQuad was so oblivious to those sort of health risk questions that in their own literature, that picture there was from their brochure. <laughs> this is in, and hey, you know, just go in the field and spray this toxic chemical and, and you'll have better crop productivity. Completely uh, disregarding the fact that he's barefoot. And, I mean, I can't begin to tell you. But I just, I didn't have to do a lot of investigative reporting. It was just there. And that says, boy, you know, things have changed even in that sense. Of a lot of those kinds of problems are being uh, dealt with faster and faster because of connectedness, because of the ability to tweet a picture from a palm oil plantation doing destructive practices, that kind of thing. Um, I started writing about the global climate system, not in dealing with global warming, but with uh, nuclear winter. In 1985, I actually have the physical magazine with me, if anyone wants. If you haven't seen a physical magazine, the young people in the room, I have one with me. I can show it to you later. I'm meeting with someone at lunch. Um, and, and, you know, look at the way that was presented in, in those days um, in journalism, you know, Earth in an ice cube. Uh, very quickly, the science clarified it looked more like, uh, as Steve Schneider wrote in a piece in Foreign Affairs, nuclear autumn. Now think about that. You know, where's the headline in nuclear autumn? How do you engage people in disarmament on the basis of the idea that after a nuclear war, burn enough cities, you'd have sort of, it would be like a little cooler. <laughs> um, right. And, of course, the Cold War ended, and that largely took the oomph out of that story um, separately. But by 1988, along came, well, I was, the article on, on nuclear winter had a bunch of piece, uh, sections that were about what we understood about global warming already. The same models were used uh, to chart the inverse impacts. 1988, my first article, my first big piece on global warming looked like that. That was the year the IPCC was chartered. It was the year that there was a meeting in Toronto, the changing atmosphere that led toward uh, what happened in 1992 with the Framework Convention. And so I've been at this for a while. And uh, if you look back at that article, and it's online, if you just Google for Revkin 1988, discover warming, you can read it and assess 
not only what, what was known at the time, but how I wrote it at the time. And I, I tried as much as I can to review my own reporting and see, did I get it right? Or, or what was, was I being hoodwinked? Or, uh, and it's a useful practice. And, you know, learn and adjust and, and review is really important. 1992, I went to the Amazon. I wrote a book about the murder of Chico Mendez, that, um, about what we were doing, to defore, what deforestation was doing. I interviewed a couple of the astronauts who were in the space shuttle who took, them, take, took some pictures from overhead that gave that global scope to that regional problem. And uh, that was, and I learned a lot about the social and economic realities that shape a lot of our environmental impacts. I also learned a lot about uh, poverty and, and that um, you can have that poverty and equity in, or the lack of equity are really a vital part of most environmental stories. I interviewed a woman, this was the child of a rubber tapper family deep in the Amazon. And the woman who, who the mother uh, had, she, I think she told me she had 17 children and 10 were alive. And she wasn't like, that was kind of just normal. She was just sort of telling it to me in an interview in a very dispassionate way. Um, the picture on the right I took um, in Manaus, which is a, it's a big city. Some of you have probably been there, but this was 1989. And the funeral parlor, funeral parlor had coffins in all sizes, kind of like Starbucks cups. And, and obviously we've done a huge amount of work uh, since then to reduce infant and child mortality. But there's still plenty of places in the world where it, it wouldn't be remarkable to see this. And to me, that says, whether I'm a journalist or a scientist, you know, you have a limited number of days on the planet. You have to choose what you focus on. If there's a social element like that that is related to your skill set, it would be great to dive in and find your place in the study there. Um, 1992 is when I wrote my first book on global warming. And this is kind of, this book, I didn't know it at the time. It sold probably like 100 copies, maybe, maybe a couple thousand. But it, uh, but it had this phrase in it that has resonated since. This is 1992, and I wrote, um, as you can see there, perhaps Earth scientists of the future will name this new post-Holocene era for its cause of development for us. We are entering an age that might someday be referred to as, say, the Anthropocene. This is, remember, I, I didn't have a lot of roots in scholarship, so I hadn't really thought about Anthropocene. And Anthropocene seemed to roll off the tongue better. After all, it is a geological age of our own making. And even then, I was laying out this concept that there could be a good path forward. You, all we can do is do the best we can with the information we have at hand at the time. And it's not like, so, so judging us too badly based on, and also understanding how we work, that, that we are, we still have these hurdles to getting things right that are pretty implicit in how we, behave, how we think about risk. Um, so I've been thinking about this, this, this question for a long time. And that's why I'm on the Anthropocene working group. I'm the only non-scientist on that group. It, it's interesting to chart the geological question going forward, but the bigger meaning of this word Anthropocene, I think, is the thing to focus on. You know, I do think it has vital and important um, relevance to how we shape our future going forward. Uh, I, I came to newspapers after doing magazines and books, and I learned a lot about this media, wacky media environment, the here and now environment, the need to get something in the paper now, even if you have imperfect information. And I, I wrote about the, I started writing about the politics of climate change, the, the, uh, the uh, diplomacy. I went to the North Pole, as I mentioned. So the fundamental science related to sea ice behavior. And, uh, and I got, you know, as I said earlier, you know, as we heard, you know, awards matter. I, I've done well as a journalist. And I started to think, you know, you, you kind of say, well, gosh, you know, I lived a good life. And then I started to uh, understand um, their limits to what I can do with journalism. Just as in science, you, many scientists I talk to have a very parallel sense of frustration. Well, you know, we know this stuff. Why doesn't everybody, once we tell them, change how they, how they work, how they live, um, how they vote? And it's so much more complicated. And in, in essence, I kind of got really bummed out around this point in my career, in the mid-2000s, mid-aughts, where I started looking at behavioral science more and more. I was writing about why we have an imperfect relationship with some kinds of risk. And uh, one thing I, I wrote at the time, well, I, I just made a new, a new visual that tries to get at this. Uh, that was the same time that An Inconvenient Truth had come out, got a lot of attention. But what didn't get a lot of attention was, was the fact that we have an inconvenient mind. That the human mind, after all my reporting on, on climate change as a sort of a geophysical, biological, technological problem, I had really neglected to write about this, like the climate inside here, you know, why we perceive some risks better than others, why, 
I would get some things wrong. So I'm going to give you a very quick tour of the social science, and this is where you know I would love for every physical scientist to sort of uh, find a way at some point to go to a like an American Psychological Association meeting, not for therapy, but but for, to sort of think to 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 get outside the boundaries, not just of uh, of your discipline as a geochemist, but outside of your discipline as a scientist studying factual data shaped uh, picture of the world to understand better why it's a hard fit for people. So, and one of the, around this time I wrote a piece, uh, well in the late 2000s I wrote a piece for Dot Earth, where I kind of looked at the landscape of Nobel Prize winning physicists. These are not just Nobel Prize winners, these are Nobel Prize winners in physics. And to see what they had publicly stated about global warming, and they're all over the map. They're all over the map such that if you wanted to go into a pub here tonight in, in, in Prague, and argue with someone about global warming, how serious it is. You could find a Nobel Prize winning physicist to suit your, your views. If you're alarmed, if you're dismissive, if you're kind of in the middle, basically they, they, these guys are, are, are emblems of those, those, those um, aspects of the argument. And culturalcognition.net, you might want to write that down. It's a, it's a website for a Yale researcher who does empirical work showing why this can, why this is the case, why you can be very smart and still completely divided on an issue like global warming. And think about that in the context of all the other issues you deal with that have social significance, whether it's toxic chemicals, uh, uh, radiological risk, it's the same thing. GMOs, the, some of the, the fights over GMOs are very similar to these fights. They're mostly not about the information. They're about your tribal identity and, and things like that. So cultural cognition, that, that is a very useful sort of distillation of that stuff. There's another term so, uh, social scientists use, uh, status quo bias. You know, we keep pointing to industry or climate deniers as being the source of our problem with global warming. And, and a cartoon was drawn by Kathy Zhang after I gave a talk on this a couple of years ago. She kind of created this cartoon around something I said, which was that society, us, we're a boulder. Uh, you know, we're kind of like very content with fossil fuels for the most part. They, they still run 80 80 plus percent of our global energy mix is still fossil fuels. And so if you're a, if you want things to stay the same, whether you're a company or just have an ideological point of view, you just can stand there with a feather duster and, and that rock doesn't move. If you're um, an environmental campaigner, climate campaigner, if you're Bill McKibben, you're kind of like the other person there. You've got a lot of work to do. And it's not just because, if you took away the feather duster, it wouldn't necessarily change things. Now, and not everything is behavioral. There is, the other thing I've learned is that infrastructure has, that we have a lot of path dependency to deal with. Path dependency, is, economists talk about this a lot, where, where your structures that have built over 100 years, and like our structures in the United States, suburbia took 100 years to build, it's not gonna instantly be rebuilt. Uh, in New York City, this is true of almost every older city, uh, New York City recently uh, estimated that, that um, in, 80% of the structures that will exist in New York City in 2050 exist today. That's structural, infrastructural inertia. It's a reality. You, having magical, mis, sort of high-speed transformations is impeded by this. It's really important information to get your head around. It can be very depressing. It can make you feel like that photographer. Um, but, but somehow this gets me back to the point about uh, having patience, that this is a journey we're on. This is not like your, your, your grandmother's environmental problem. It's not something you just fix on a single in a single generation, a single presidency, a single um, IPCC report. And just to give you a quick sense of this, uh, the Heinrich Boll Foundation did this report on the German, the German, well basically persistent reliance on coal in Germany, even with all the work they've done on renewables. And this is what it looks like. This is uh, essentially since re reunification or so. Um, you can see the bands at the bottom, all those big fat bands are oil, um, uh, lignite, or, or uh, hard coal. And it shows you that the, the gains in renewables have come at the, with the loss, have made up for the loss of nuclear generation, but haven't really nudged those, the big chunk of their primary energy. And that says to me again, even in a country that really took this on, you know, that gets a lot of credit for being green, it's still very hard work. So it, it, it's important for me to remember those backstories. The backstories really often are much more important, if more sobering, than the story you hear. And as I said, you know, <laughs> you can get back into this mode very quickly. 
uh, whether you're a journalist or a scientist or a politician or whoever. Um, and this is one of the other things I've learned in, the, in my like in this my career is that a lot of this adds up to a misplaced sense of our goals. Often our goals in climate, for sure, and in other arenas as well, have been numbers, 350, 80 by 2050, 2 degrees. And when you look at those things I just charted out, not just behavioral, not just infrastructural, um, it takes time to change um, energy systems particularly. It leads you to think, well, if you, you know, these numbers are fine, but how do you get there? How do you get there? If you don't know, if you can't chart a, a when 350 and a how 350 that could work in the real world, as a journalist who's been through all this, like, I'm not going to pay attention to you. I need to know when and how. And then, and if you can't answer those questions, I'm not going to just walk away. But I am going to say, well, what can you do in the meantime? What are the knobs that you can adjust? What societally, as individuals or countries or, or cities, what are the things you can do to make a difference? And that once you start nudging trajectories, you can be very surprised about where things can go. So instead of numbers, I, I've started to focus more on traits. Like what are the traits, characteristics, capacities that can surprise us on the upside? And, and a couple of years ago, I started out with a tweet on this, which is kind of silly. But it, but it kind of encapsulates in a few words, uh, and I'm going to race through what they mean in a bigger way, just because I don't want to run out of time. Um, ben, essentially, strategy for sustainable human progress is uh, to focus on capacities like bend, stretch, reach, teach, reveal, reflect, rejoice, repeat. And then I did separate tweets on each of those. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to very quickly give you a sense of what I mean. Bend is uh, resilience, you know, but it's not just a resilience. You know, there's all these wonderful visions of resilient cities. Um, the question is, how do you get there? In, in New York City, it's not a question of design. There are all these great designs for a softer city that can absorb a sandy. Uh, and, you know, think about any country where you have similar issues. The question is the politics. The mayor of New York City uh, gave a his last big speech before he left uh, Bloomberg. It was a great speech on global warming, but it was a we will not retreat speech, which would make it a fundamentally unscientific speech. No matter what we do with carbon dioxide emissions, we're facing sea level rise. We don't know the pace, but we do know centuries of sea level rise are coming, and uh, even on the best case scenario. So, so we will not retreat speech is done. This doesn't work. So what would work? What's that speech look like? And that says that communication innovation is as important, perhaps, as, as um, technological innovation. Uh, bend is also adaptability. So here's a, whoops, sorry. Here's a young guy, uh, Billy Parrish, and ten years ago he was at the climate talks leading kind of student activism, and now he runs a small company in California that's making it easier to finance solar panel installation on roofs. So he's bent in his own life. He's found a way. He's, his goal has not changed. His, his approach has changed. It's defining, making sure you're not too path dependent, that you can actually reinvent yourself, I think is a really important uh, uh, trait going forward. So how do we sustain or, or, or foster that? Uh, this is too, I, I don't want to get into the details of this, but there's Elm in 2003 wrote a, pa a paper about uh, ecological resilience seems to come not just from the number of species, it's not, it's not species diversity, it's response diversity. And that, that's a very important distinction. The responses to environmental stresses in an ecosystem are what make it uh, robust, not the number of, of species. And when I think about that in, the, in social context, it gets back to this, this, this sense of getting, of being a, a variegation being your friend. Uh, so just think about that concept in the, in the context of social uh, structures. And you get the idea. I'm gonna, I can, we'll post this, or it'll be online if you want to dig in on the details. I can give you more. Scientists, you know, come in all shapes and sizes. There's the Jim Hansons, who are willing to get arrested uh, in front of coal-fired power plants. Susan Solomon, who was the head of the rollout of uh, Working Group 1 in 2007, who's very much about science is here. Uh, my, my job is not to tell you what to do with this information. Uh, there's some who want to innovate, there's some who want to agitate, and that's all part of the human approach to problems. And I think we need to get comfortable with that. One recent example that's worth thinking about, a bunch of conservation biologists, including Tom Lovejoy, Barry Brook, um, wrote a letter, there was 60 or 70 of them, and it was in this uh, paper also, Key Role for Nuclear Energy and Global Biodiversity Conservation. And I'm sure for some people in this room that would come as like a, <laughs> wait, we're, we don't want nuclear. 
but, but if we're not willing to examine why there could be a, a group of many dozens of conservation biologists who can't see a safe climate system without nuclear, if we can't integrate that into how we feel and think and behave and communicate, then we're missing, uh, missing some important points. So that's Ben. Stretch is, is, is uh, science. It's basically the ability to grasp a new idea, play with it, fail, failing, failing forward, as they say. And you know what? I'm going to skip this, except to say we're not adequately investing in frontier research in, in, in energy sciences, so that the idea that we are engaged sufficiently on, on the basic inquiry part of dealing with things like climate change is, is a fantasy. Uh, and actually, just to save time, because I know we're running short, just follow up with me on what these graphs mean. Essentially, we're asleep, and it's a bipartisan sleep slumber on energy science. And this is OECD. The green curve is, is military uh, R&D, basic science, but it's military. Uh, energy is the, perp the, the lilac one down at the bottom. So this is all the OECD countries, the wealthy industrialized countries. Essentially, we're not engaged. And if you don't have that bubbling up from the bottom, you can't have entrepreneurs and innovators taking that and running with it and making it into a new, a new energy system. Ben Stretch reaches communication. This is, you know, the thing I really care about. Uh, and again, I, wanna, I don't want to waste too much time. In India, 100 million farmers, how do you get bright ideas around about better planting techniques? The Indian um, uh, Extension Service is using YouTube in a clever way to have local farmers in their own languages taking some better planting technique and putting it on YouTube. And other farmers are now, it's a way to amplify the, the ability of that Extension Service to reach 100 million farming families. So it's really a, a vital thing. Twitter is, is your friend. Uh, Twitter seems like noise. And I know there's some uh, Twitter evangelists here. But you can cut through all that noise, not just with hashtags. But this just shows you. There's a hashtag for I am a scientist because. Please look at that one. It's really cool. I'm going to end with that, too. Um, EnviroEd is environmental education. Um, bird class is a, is a great bird biology course at University of Connecticut that spills their learning out onto into Twitter space. And so you can organize that information. You can use it on an as-needed basis. Twitter is not your enemy. It doesn't have to be an overload mode thing. Escaping from what Randy Olson, a friend of mine who's kind of a, a former marine biologist who's become an evangelist for science communication, he talks about the nerd loop, that we're, too often we're in the nerd loop. We talk to each other about how to communicate science better, but we're not actually trying to communicate science better. And we ha getting out of that nerd loop is important. These are, I, I, these are examples. Now, it's easier to do that if you have tenure, like Richard Alley over there on the left, you know, one of the most lauded climate scientists around. But, but uh, there's ways to do it if you don't have tenure as a young scientist that can make you uh, clarify for the public what's going on. On Twitter, these are just a few examples of people in climate who've become a valuable presence on Twitter, who uh, are there to help clarify what's real and not real. Some of this has to get us away from old habits. The IPCC sent this note to its authors in 2010, ahead of the last climate writing report, where they said, I love this, there's always a list of words that mean one thing to scientists and something else entirely to the public. To lower the risk of being understood, don't use them. As opposed to using them and explaining them, finding out how to communicate to the public, to me, this is really not productive. And one of the words is uncertainty. So don't use that word. Think about that. So how do you how do you get around that? Well, you have what I think is important, whether you're a journalist or a scientist, is to say what's the color of that uncertainty, but un and remind people that uncertainty doesn't mean you don't know anything. It's bounded uncertainty is knowledge. It's, it creates a space in which to act, in which we do that all the time. And in, in, in investment in military affairs, uh, getting comfortable with these terms requires us to use them and to find to find ways to, to clarify diff different meanings. I wrote a piece about some of this. If you just write down this URL, j.mp slash WMO Revka, it was a piece for the World Meteorological Organization Bulletin that gets at some of these opportunities. Luckily, even as journalists like me are kind of shrinking part of the landscape, a lot of entities, um, universities, are creating websites that are significant, popular, and can help clarify those issues I was just talking about. Uh, these are just a, a, a smattering of them. Um, the conversation, I was talking to someone about this earlier, is a website that's become kind of a commentary space 
for scientists and scholars to uh, to get out there and, and discuss with the public, have pieces that get at uh, real-time uh, policy issues. Uh, I found this Robin Wiley, U University College London volcanologist, doctoral candidate, who was just really good when a big volcano was coming, was, was erupting in uh, Papua New Guinea. He was out there with some basic, fascinating geological context. And I found him through search, just searching for news on that Papua New Guinea uh, volcano. And here's this guy. And so he's connected with me through this system. I never would have heard from him before. His capacity to tell stories uh, has made him a public presence on things like volcanoes. And I'm going to really fast forward. Um, teach, bend, stretch, reach, teach is finding new ways to teach. And, you know, everyone talks about education. Some of them can be really simple. In the Bronx, there's a high school where the students become systems analysts. They go down to the boiler room on, uh, for a day. The, the custodian who manages the furnace and all the other systems of that school teaches the class for the day how much oil they use, uh, where, you know, what the cost of that is, uh, efforts to uh, tighten up the structure to make it more weather weatherized. Uh, and what, you know, so every school is a system. We forget that. Every school, university, elementary school, and just having a day when students look at the school as a system is just a fundamentally way, fundamentally new and rich way to think about transcending some of our roadblocks in education. Uh, I do my own, you know, I left journalism full time and I know we make films that go on, on YouTube and other uh, venues about conservation issues. And it's, uh, there's the barrier to entry is you don't have to work for CBS News to have that happen anymore. Um, reveal is, well, science is about revealing things, of course. But reveal, in this sense, reveal means transparency. Um, Greenpeace is really good at drawing these lines, connections for consumers from the product, the Kit Kat bar you buy, and the palm oil plantation that is the source. And they've changed corporate behavior as a result. Greg Asner, he's, he's surveying uh, gold mining in the uh, Peruvian Amazon. He was mainly doing remote sensing work, but he stuck a GoPro camera on his plane on the plane. And, and lo and behold, that GoPro imagery became viral in Peru and became a fundamental, uh, it, it made the gold mining in the Amazon, in that part of the Amazon, a real political issue. And he had, and that was like a secondary thought. It was like, hey, let's just put a GoPro on the plane. And making that more of a normal thought, it would be a great thing. And then you don't have that. Then we have so much more potential to gather and shape, uh, share information in ver various means. Sometimes it's as simple as a wavelength. This is a sunny day in Colorado, an oil tank, storage tank. This is the same storage tank using infrared cameras. And uh, as you know, um, greenhouse gases are opaque to infrared radiation. That's why you can see the, the um, leakage of the, 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 um, the gas. It's mostly methane there. And that says to me, if, you're gonna, if you want people to pay attention to uh, invisible emissions, well, just change the, the, the way you look at them and you can have big progress. Showing versus telling. That's all the globe's atmosphere, if you put it in a spherical form. Here's one. I, I, a common mistake when interpreting Here's something statistics else. is to look at them from too short a distance. This can make everything unclear and confused. So forget the details and take a step back. You're looking at the dog when you should be concentrating on the owner. As you can see, the dog is all over the place, leaping and bouncing, sometimes upwards, sometimes downwards. But where do you think it would be in 10 seconds' time? around here, right? But at this moment, the dog is on its way downwards, so why do you think it will find itself up there? It's because you notice the owner. The owner is the trend, and it's he who determines where they both will be in a while as a bit longer than a couple of dog pounds. He could change direction, there's a lot we don't know about this guy, but everything we do know indicates he's heading in that direction. The owner is a long-term trend, the dog is the variation around this trend. Or the owner is the climate, the dog is the weather. Yeah, so, you know, trend and variation. <laughs> Very innovative little um, Scandinavian um, visualization company. And you would think, well, you know, that, yeah, so that was popular in Scandinavia. But I, it turns out that um, then uh, Cosmos, the, uh, the, which had been seen by millions of people already, uh, took that same that same way of presenting trend and variation used it in the show in a way where he walked where Neil deGrasse Tyson walked on the beach you can see the trend and variation so so good ideas good ways of, good ways of explaining ideas uh, can propagate in ways that we, we um, have not have not been possible before 
Fence stretch reached each review. Reflect is uh, pausing, and again, as I said earlier, like, how are we doing? You know, with me, it's with my journalism. One thing that's led me to keep trying different media is that sense of never being kind of content or too comfortable in trying to examine my own path of endlessly. It's really hard to do that. So reflection is, uh, hey, I just took this picture this morning in the hallway here, uh, is finding ways to collaborate, finding ways to rub shoulders with people with slightly different fe uh, disciplines or, or, or worldviews. And um, I encourage you to go, USGS JWP is uh, the John Wesley Powell Center, which is a USGS facility in Colorado where, where methodological problems are hashed out. And the scientists, among other things, who might be fighting with each other in the literature, go for a hike. And as they explained there, they found that when you're hiking up a hill in the Rockies, I'm sure in the Alps it's the same, you don't have the energy to fight. You don't have the energy to yell or argue. Uh, you, you do have the energy to collaborate, to say, hey, you want a piece of cheese, to start to sit down and hash out problems. So all this is really, really vitally important. Another part of reflecting is reflecting on your place in society. You know, scientists and journalists, you know, we all feel kind of important, and that we, we say something, the world needs to sort of drop everything and do it. I was at the Vatican in 2014 at the meeting, four-day meeting that sort of set the stage for the encyclical, and it was a very welcome reminder that the values and science are together are how we end up approaching problems. That, and that gets back to what I was saying about nuclear power versus other solutions to global warming. Uh, the best thing about this meeting was simply that it was, it was social scientists, physical scientists, Paul Crutzen was there, um, Walter Monk was there, an ocean, a great oceanographer, Ramanathan, a great um, uh, atmospheric chemist, um, and, and the Pope popped by. Um, this is like one of those Where's Waldo pictures. I'm, I'm there over to the on the right hand side, right near Paul Crutzen. And it was just great to see that it has to come together. You have to recognize that science is only part of how we decide things, and, and, that, and that leads to a certain comfort. It, it, some could say resignation, but it's different than that. Um, finally, there's another reflection. Uh, Dan Kamen, and, uh, who's worked at the frontiers, uh, sort of the cutting edge of energy science, and also in Africa on energy access, and Michael Dove at Yale. In the 90s, they wrote a paper about what they called the virtues of mundane science, mundane science. And, and they just have a new uh, book chapter out about this, too. It, you can review this later. The bottom line is they're saying mundane science, along with the new knowledge that generating science, has to be part of how we proceed. And this gets that uh, I was involved with Future Earth, this evolving, weird kind of, you don't really know what it is yet, but it's a research initiative aimed at sort of building stakeholders into the science process earlier on. Hey, you know, cities have a hard time figuring out uh, sanitation issues. Can, what, can, what do you have in your head that can help you fix that? That, that's, that's another part of the reflection part. Rejoice was one of the goofier words. You know, this is my son years ago in uh, one of the um, redwood um, forests in California. Obviously, that's the simple form of rejoicing. Another form is you know, looking at human landscapes and realizing that even in a dense city like Beijing, you can have, you can have a quality life. You can have uh, even chunks of nature, anthropogenic nature, for sure. Um, but I, I, I found this when I was there for a, for a future Earth meeting, um, that, that even a megacity can have functionality and beauty. Um, what Thoreau called this the swamp at the edge of town, that not, not just the wilderness has value, but little chunks of it. And then here's another form of rejoicing. Uh, I am a scientist because that Twitter hashtag resulted in uh, Andrew Warren uh, Andy Warren putting out this one about, I'm incessantly curious about nature. Hag moth caterpillar is, is one of his research foci. And, and sharing your sense of joy, not being afraid to do that, can be hard for scientists, but I think it's helpful. And then finally, repeat. Repeat is probably the hardest one. It's kind of like getting enough exercise, which I don't. Um, um, the discipline of doing things, assessing, stopping, reviewing, moving forward, uh, is, is really vital. And so how, how to build that in to how you work forward is, is important. And in all these terms, you know, just finally, and I'm right at the end, um, there, there's, I look at parenthood kind of the same way, like you can, you can, when you become a parent, you look at your kid as a baby and you say, well, all you want to do is protect them. All you want to do is create a safe space for them. And that's, 
society has been like that. But, you know, all we want to do is have the UN set limits. And, and it's not that simple. What's harder is to say, what are the qualities I can put in my child that can give that person, that child the best chance of navigating a turbulent, complicated life and having an education that matters and, and building a society that matters. And it comes back to those same kinds of things, bend, stretch, reach, teach, flexibility, adaptability, communicativeness. And so when you think about this from either of those standpoints, I think you end up with the same message. Now, there's plenty of other words. There's grieve. There are losses. You know, I wrote in 2007 about the extinction of the Baiji and the, the, the uh, Yangtze River dolphin. And right now, the vaquita in the, the, the Gulf of California is going down the same two, going down, circling the drain. And so there's lots of things to be sad about. Engaging with that is important, and, and conveying that is important too. Hope is, a, is another one, I think, that is less shared, less often. The Hudson River had largely lost its great populations of, of Atlantic sturgeon uh, after gross overfishing. And as you know, these are slow growing fish, slow maturing, slow reproducing. Now there's been a ban, and I was out on the Hudson River um, a few years ago in two different capacities. This is a baby Atlantic sturgeon. Thrilling these kids. And I was out with it. That's me helping to release that tag. So if you give nature half a chance, things surprising things can happen. Um, I'm going to stop there, and I say thank you very much. I think I'm literally at the end. I, I, I'd love to have questions and answers. I'll be at a session with young uh, students here at, at lunch. Um, easy to find on Twitter and all these other media. And uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for this uh, entertaining and, uh, in fact, very optimistic vision. In terms of in many ways. In many ways. Yeah. Okay, so you did. Thank you. Oh, well, I, I was going to play that, but I think it's kind of ended up saying that. Mm -hmm. Well, well, let's have a little bit of music. And oh, as you're filing out, you can hear one of my songs. Sorry, I should. Oh, you are? This is filing out music. It's a song about carbon. It took a thousand generations for our species to rise. But gathering and hunting was no way to get by. We yearned to burn more than dung and sticks. Then someone came along and said, hey, try like this. He opened up the ground and showed us coal and oil. Said, come liberate some carbon, it'll make your blood boil. Liberated carbon, it'll spin your wheels. Liberated carbon, it'll nuke your meals. Liberated carbon, it'll turn your night into day. Hey, hey, come on, deliver it some carbon, baby, it's the American way. I got heat swamp fossils under my TV. BP's black label burns in my SUV. We can light up the planet like a Christmas tree. Yeah, they say that things are getting hot, but hey, we've got AC. Liberated carbon, it'll spin your wheels. Liberated carbon, it'll cook your meals. Liberated carbon, it'll turn your night to day. Hey, hey, come on and liberate some carbon, babe, it's American way. Dump those electrons and that gasoline. No sweat or hurry, just turn on a machine. We send an army to the desert, keep this country free. Hey, hey, I can liberate some carbon, baby, for you and me. Liberated carbon, it'll spin your wheels. Liberated 
This closed the plenary session of today, and now Andy is going to be locked in a room with live students. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you.